Hello, Sid Roth here, and I have really been looking forward to this interview because my guest, it, it, it'll sound standard, but trust me, just keep listening. My guest was raised in a good Christian home. However, he kept feeling these tendencies towards homosexuality, started practicing this, uh, and uh, for years, knowing it was sin, Knowing uh, the, 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 that Jesus was real, uh, he had this tug of war going on, and years he had failed attempts at freedom. In his early 20s, he went for uh, a deliverance, cast a spirit out. I mean, he was desperate. Uh, Ken, Ken Williams, you were desperate for freedom because you wanted to serve God and you knew what the Bible said, but there was something stronger than you pulling against your desire. Um, why did you even go through a deliverance? I tried everything, Sid. I, I, there was such an internal conflict inside of me. Like my, you know, it, it was so shocking and humiliating and depressing to in my teens to find myself sexually desiring other males when I, that never was something I would have thought of. I, I, I wanted to just have a family and have a wife and all that, but this is what I'm attracted to. So, you know, I did, I did everything I could do. I, I went to Christian counseling for five years weekly and, you know, I, I read books. I, there weren't many resources back then, you know, back then when I first was, was struggling in my teens. But uh, eventually I turned to prayer ministry, you know, some deliverance ministry, um, because the idea once I learned, Sid, that it wasn't just necessarily just all right. There might actually be forces, uh, uh, you know, forces of darkness that were influencing me. That was very encouraging because. You know, I'm like, well, that would explain a little bit why I am so strongly drawn to uh, to things that I don't want to be drawn to. Yeah, you were desperate and, for answers. So uh, tell yeah. me, let, let me fast forward you to the deliverance. What happened? Um, it, it was it was dramatic. I there were several things that happened in that time. One was um, I started choking. They were ministering to me and I started choking. And um, it was as if this this spirit was trying to uh, trying to snuff me out, trying to stifle me. Um, and uh, and I was just like it was it was laughing. I, I noticed that I was laughing and um, kind of really a, a, a not a pleasant laugh. And I realized, wow, this is a spirit that has been mocking me all, all of these years. And, you know, that wasn't the some total of of my of my healing journey that was, this was one tiny part but but basically what it showed me was that the enemy is trying to steal kill and destroy from me he's trying to convince me that that there's not hope for me or that there's something inherently wrong with me when actually i just ha ha was being influenced by from the outside the holy spirit was orchestrating that whole time so it was it was almost as if I was watching a movie and the Lord was doing surgery on me. And, and it was it was uh, it sounds dramatic, but I felt so much peace through the whole thing. And when I came out of that time, I felt like I felt like someone had thrown 15 blankets of me over me and smashing me to the floor, like with this hug and just the warmth and the, and the love. I mean, I felt. I felt totally free and like I had not a care in the world. It was the most wonderful thing. But during that experience, like, yeah, I, I, I heard one thing. Um, I heard a, a little boy crying. And I, I, I remember looking around to see where the little boy was. And I realized, oh, my goodness, I'm the one who's crying. But it sounded like a little boy. And so, you know, the ministers, they, they just came and they comforted me. They, they hugged me. Because, you know, and, and really so much, I believe, of homosexuality, it's not so much a demonic thing. It's it's uh, it's needs did not get met. Rejection happened that caused me to stop my emotional development, things like that. 
um, soul ties got formed, different things. But but basically, uh, that little boy that had gotten stuck at the age that I saw pornography, I, I believe, is a big thing that happened. Um, they they came and they they loved they loved that part of me so that it could kind of get the healing it needed and then and then go ahead and grow up with the rest of me. But that something even happened physically to you. This has happened to others mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that I've talked with. However, it doesn't happen to everyone. But right. I mean, this this was amazing. Uh, there were changes in your body. I mean, to the point where you're you got a half inch taller in height. Uh, you didn't have as yeah. an effeminate appearance, which uh, uh, when you had that deliverance. Um, you uh, and then after that, that you had that void, they prayed for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What was that like? Um, yeah, I mean, I I just didn't have a care in the world. I was I I was completely uh, I, I felt somewhat you know drunk even in the Holy Spirit because I just all of my cares had been taken away. God was in control. I was okay with Him. Okay, you're so you're filled with the spirit you feel peace like you've, you've never experienced in your life and then hours later there's a soul it's hard to fathom you're mm -hmm. sexually attracted to a man yeah the I, man I, that did I, I bet you were so crushed yes i was but it, what the lord had done for me in in coming and touching me and setting me free of these torments and all that was so real it paid that the, the attraction I felt really paled in comparison because I thought, well, okay, I don't know what to do about this attraction I'm still feeling. I was hoping I wouldn't feel that anymore. But what I do know is God has come near and He cares about me and He's giving me solutions. So I'm going to stay on this God train until it takes me, you know, all the way as far as I need to go. And then one day, He's taking a shower, as they like to say, <laughs> minding His own business. Yeah. And he gets a revelation from God. What happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was um, that was actually after I was married, and I was seeking the Lord. I was wanting to help more people that are struggling in their sexuality, and I was like, Lord, how you know mine? Mine happened. Mine was a, a process of walking with you. How did you bring me healing? How can I break this down for people to try to offer healing to others? And and I was praying for that in that season of time. And one day in the shower and, you know, I'm minding my own business, taking a shower. And then I start getting this download of these different, different terms. Um, and I, at first I didn't know what they were, but uh, then I realized, oh my goodness, Lord, this is, this, this is kind of the key areas that you addressed in my life on my journey of healing of my sexuality. And here is the thing that I'm so excited about. I have a quote, uh, in the shower, the Lord downloaded keys to freedom. Freedom. Mm -hmm. Not just abstinence, which is what he was practicing, but freedom. Mm -hmm. And you say, if you do these things, you can be set free from anything, not just homosexuality. What are some of the other things that these steps will set you free of? Yeah, I mean, I believe he downloaded to me a basic discipleship process. You know, it's like people could do all six of those things and not see any result. It's it's are you connecting with the Lord in those areas? Is are you following the Lord as he leads you to address these different you know areas of discipleship? So let me see if I have this right. Because you had the deliverance, you were um, you could abstain from homosexuality, so to speak. But mm -hmm. you still, it didn't stop all being bombarded by these same feelings until you moved into these six supernatural keys that God gave you. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I would get a major breakthrough. Uh, I can tell you in hindsight, I would get a major breakthrough by, a, by letting the Lord deal with these six different areas. So you know, the first one was vulnerability. So I had to start actually sharing with other solid Christians what I'm actually struggling with because I, and all the shame was kept inside because it was humiliating to have same sex attraction, particularly in the eighties when I was, you know, growing mm -hmm. up. And it's like, I had to realize no love is really going in 
people are trying to show me love, but I'm always thinking to myself, if they really knew what I'm really dealing with, they wouldn't love me. So vulnerability was the first of those keys. You got to be, you got to confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Um, so that was a huge breakthrough for me. Um, and then uh, surrender. Uh, you know, out of curiosity, out of curiosity, can you identify what was the crack in your armor, if you will, as mm -hmm. a young child that led you in this in this direction you certainly came from a nice christian family so it yeah. wasn't the family but what 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 was it that that broke that open uh i i believe it was mostly it was that i had rejected masculinity i i judged masculinity as less than and there were all kinds of different ways in my childhood where that lie you know i believed a lie that masculinity was ungodly now, and just, so, uh, but, but, but what even caused that? Uh, multiple things. Um, you know, so I heard tell me from a few. A few, yeah. I I heard from um, you know a trusted spiritual leader that they really thought that it would be better if sex hadn't been created because it caused so many problems in the world, which we see so many problems. Um, I also realized from scripture that you know Paul said, well, it's better if you can you know stay single. I thought to myself, you know, Jesus wasn't married. I'm trying to be like Jesus. Um, the boys made fun of me mercilessly because I was the little scrawny kid in every class when I was growing up. And so I, I, I just started judging you know, males as not kind, not good. And then when I saw graphic, hardcore gay pornography and the way that men were treating each other, things I will not share here, but things that you can't imagine, um, I thought, oh my gosh, this men are bad. And so all those things were, you know, wounding my sense of self, wounding my understanding of God and of, of my masculine identity. Now, briefly, uh, tell me the, uh, the rest of the six keys, just very briefly, mm -hmm. because yeah. uh, then we're going to make your book available. Uh, and oh, it's an e-book, uh, so it's, it's something that anyone can get instantly and download. Uh, but uh, uh, continue with the keys. Okay. Surrender is the second key. I find that most people on this journey um, of addressing their sexuality are stuck at either vulnerability or they're stuck at surrender a lot of times. So surrender, um, I'm talking about a wholesale, total surrender. The Lord invited me to do that. And it was a dramatic shift for me because I had been pursuing getting, getting free of the homosexuality for 14 years with very little success until a, 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 you know, a minister said, hey, why don't you give up all your rights, Ken? Pray to God you give up all your rights to ever be gratified by a male sexually again. And I realized, oh my goodness, what's wrong with me that I've done all this work to see if I can find freedom from this and I'm not willing to let go of this? And so I had to repent. I took the weekend to think about it and I, and I, and I did. And I prayed that prayer from my heart. And it's like it gave it, it, it was me handing the keys to the Lord and saying, you know what, if I never have another sexual arousal, if I never have an orgasm again, if I if I never not doesn't matter what comes after that, I'm going your way, Lord, I, I have uh, my best option is to completely sell out to you. And I mean, Sid, that that, you know, it's like talk about deliverance. That's deliverance right there, like following Jesus wholeheartedly. Um, bonded me so intimately with the Lord that I was able to receive what I needed from him. So I won't go into as much detail with the other four, but that was the second, um, the second discipleship key that he showed me. Then relationships, um, people that are sexually broken, um, re their relationships are, I mean, it's pretty much always, there are challenges relationally that need to be restored and need to be addressed and healed by the Lord. Um, identity is another huge one. I spent a summer simply reading Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. Just those four chapters all summer long. And Sid, I mean, you know, you know it as well as I do, but I mean, when I learned that I'm not just a sinner, but, but I'm actually a saint, and that the because of Jesus, that I am to reckon myself dead to sin, but alive unto Christ in the same way that Jesus was you know, died and then was raised from the dead into newness of life. I'm supposed to reckon myself to be that. 
Instead, it gave me permission to let go of whatever previous identity I believed I had and cling simply onto this new creation reality that Jesus says that we have. The Bible says all the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the Lord invited me to believe him that I could embrace that with regard to even my identity, my sexuality. I could be considered novel. That word new is novel, brand new, never anything like it before. And, you know, the Lord invited me to, to believe that. And, you know, it started to play out in my life. But not, not that minute, but within a few years, I find myself noticing this girl across the way in my young adults group I was helping lead. And I just started falling in love with her. Now, and, you're, and you're, you're married. married. You're married today. How many children? We have four children together and we've been married since 2006. Um, you know, I, I, I have to ask you this question. Um, there are many people that are gay and they say, I was born this way. Yeah. Uh, this is the way God made me. Totally. Uh, what would you say to them right now? I Speak mean, to them. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I want to give them a hug, first of all, because I know that pain. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to have felt like I wasn't like the other boys and therefore was gay or had some alt identity from the time I was so young that, I, you know, it would be easy to feel like I was born that way. Um, the, the science does not support that. There is new, very solid gold standard, you know, uh, journal in different journals and peer peer journal approved and all that stuff that that is very clear based on a study of f almost 500,000 people that there isn't a gay gene people are not born that way and so Sid here's the thing if that's the case what what is the what is the best healing for a person who feels that they're gay is it for all of culture to say, yes, we make a space for you and we applaud that that's who you are? Or is it to say, well, we're going to love everybody. I don't care who you are. And but but let's come close to you, sir or ma'am. And, and tell me what is going on inside. How have you you know what what happened to you in your childhood? Do you is your sense of self solid and strong? Do you feel extravagantly loved by the extravagantly loved by the Lord and by your community? Like we get in there and we find out what pains have been in there? What who's hurt them? I'm telling you, a large percentage of people, God bless them, in LGBTQ lives and in that community were abused, were taken advantage of, were rejected. And we've got to get to these people with love and grace. Um, so thank you for asking that question. It's it, it, we're not born that way, but it sure does feel like it. So we got to have grace for that. Uh, you were telling me one study uh, uh, that scientifically proved this wasn't true last night on the telephone. Yeah, the GANA study. Uh, ex explain the bottom line of that. Uh, yes, it, it looked at 493,000 people um, over a 30-year period of time. They studied the entire human genome. So every, every one of the g pieces of genetic, genetic material for all of those people, and they studied that over 30 years, looking for, is there a gay gene? And the study came back, no, no, there is not. There are some markers, some, there is some small amount of heritability, but actually, if you're gonna go with that, then actually people are bo born cigarette smokers and they're born divorcees. If you're gonna say that homosexuality is inborn. Uh, there seems to be a strategy by, uh, the gay activists to fundamentally change America. And, and I see, I observe it. Uh, I, I, I get reports of people that uh, they have their children in school in the early grades, uh, first grade or something. And the teacher says, I want you to think about this and tell me, are you a boy or a girl? I mean, is that just happening or is there a strategy in the invisible world leading mm -hmm. leading uh, some of the, the activists in the gay community mm -hmm. to change America, uh, to make it, I kind of hate to say this because, but really like a Sodom and Gomorrah where that was the acceptable 
uh, relationship, men with men and women with women. Yeah. This is a this is a, a very challenging time right now because uh, the advancement of queer theory, you know, this LGBTQ agenda is marching on very strongly into classrooms, into you know young children's environments, the public library, all of that. But I'll tell you what: here's the thing that we, as the church, need to take responsibility for now. We need to realize that. For someone like me, so you know, back in the in the '80s when I'm struggling with my identity, I couldn't find a safe place to go to to talk about my feelings. I, there was no sense of grace at my church that said, "Hey, okay, if someone is struggling with their sexual identity, come to us. We want to help you. Jesus can can help address any need in a person's life." I didn't hear that. All I heard was homosexuals are the worst people on the planet and God wants to send them to hell. I mean, that's what I was, that's what I heard. And so in an absence of that, Sid, in an absence of the church kind of worldwide saying, hey, we love you, come closer, God has answers for you. We left them to solve this for themselves. And you don't solve homosexuality without God. And so now we have people who've been wounded for so long and didn't get help from the church and actually were called horrible things by the church that there's a lot of offense there. And so they have organized and, and understandably so, if I could be so bold, I mean, they're, they are hurt. And so they're the one, you know, so many in that community are wonderful people that, you know, are, are loving and gentle and all of that, but activists are well-funded and that need for acceptance that they didn't get as children in many cases, they are trying to get it. And, and so, boy, we need to respond with love. Like we need to put feet to our love and, and stand up against these laws. We need, to, we need to resist the evil that is trying to change our morals. Um, but boy, we got to do it with love to the individuals with us because everybody just needs more Jesus, which is why you do this show, I think, Sid. You lead a ministry at um, Bill Johnson's Bethel Church in mm -hmm. Redding, California, uh, where you teach these principles. The, and these are supernatural keys. They're just they're not just a 12 step program or something. They're keys that God himself gave you that worked in your life. And you've seen thousands of people that, that have come out of this lifestyle by just following these keys. Uh, j just briefly mention the keys that you've left out. Mm -hmm. um, identity was the last one I said. So then en enduring faith. So, you know, we got to have the kind of faith that keeps on contending, even if we don't get a breakthrough the first time we pray. And then vision. At some point in my life, the Lord invited me to start envisioning my future as different from what my past was and to imagine, OK, what if God has a wife for me and what might that be like? And what if I had children and and that kind of thing? Um, yeah. What do you think? What do you think in your heart of hearts when you look at your wife, you look at all your children and you say, that's what God intended for me. Mm -hmm. And I could have gone this whole life and missed it. What oh, goes man. on inside of you? Well, there's nothing. There's nothing more important to me than my wife and my family. I mean, I, they, I mean, yeah, they're mine. I mean, I, I can't imagine life without them. They're the most beautiful, wonderful things. The joy I get from my children is it, it, incredible. Like I have, I have twins that are eight years old right now, a boy, boy, girl twins, and they love each other so extravagantly and take, take care of each other. And I mean, just, I would have missed, you know, I would have missed being able to pass on my legacy, you know, in, in a DNA form. And it's, it's, it's the most wonderful thing, just the relational health. Like Sid, I always was searching for another male to complete me or like to, I was searching for a better me, okay? At the depths, mm. I was searching for me. And, and, and I, it, I would find it in a more attractive pack, package, bigger, stronger, more powerful, more self-confident. I want that. So I wanted to get it externally since I didn't know how to get it from God or get it internally. But my wife now, I, I, get to, I love her out of my overflow. God has filled me up so much that now it's like, it's a joy to give to her. Uh, it's it's a completely different approach to you know a, to a loving relationship than I was capable of before. 
So God knew what he was doing when he said he made the male and female. Yes. <laughs> the two should become one. Uh, yes, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, why'd you write this book, The Journey Out? Oh, I wrote it because there are people suffering. I mean, when I went into the Christian bookstore, finally got up the nerve to go out and look for a resource because there was no internet back then. And I, you know, I sneak in the, the bookstore with a ball cap on and there wasn't a single book that would offer any hope for change if you found yourself as a homosexual or with same-sex attraction. And I, I just couldn't, you know, I could not stomach the idea of once I, God had touched me and, and led me through so much healing, I couldn't imagine not, you know, offering to the world the same things that the Lord offered to me. I mean, these people are wonderful people who just are, are crying out for love, like meaningful, you know, intimate love. And God has that. I mean, he, oh my goodness, he loves us so extravagantly. I, I, I had to just put it in a book so that people could get it. And, and you know what I think is so wonderful about these supernatural keys? Uh, if someone's addicted to pornography, mm -hmm. uh, if someone, I believe if someone has a big anger problem, yeah. I believe that these keys, you know, you know what this is, Ken? This is normal discipleship that very <laughs> few Christians in the world have ever gone through. I, I can tell you when I got saved, I didn't have a systematic discipleship, but most mm -hmm. systematic discipleships leave out. It's almost as if it's an American version of discipleship, not a Bible version of discipleship. Right. Do you agree right. with that? I do. It, it's, it, is, it is my pathway that I'm walking with God step by step. And, and yes, it needs to be all him, not Americanized or anything like that, because the potency, we want the potency of God leading us to address every area of our lives. And I mean, Sid, I had both those. I had profound addiction to pornography for years that I, I, I do not deal with, have not done any of that for probably 16, 17 years. You know, ma masturbation, completely addicted. I now, that is not even a temptation for many years. Um, and it, it, anger, totally, I was addicted. You know, I had a, a raging anger. God delivered me of that. So amen to everything you said. Is there hope for every gay person and person with the addictions you just mentioned and any other, is there a hundred percent hope for them if they follow and practice the teaching you have in the six supernatural keys? So I'll say it this way. I can't promise anyone anything because I don't have the power to do anything, but I always point people to what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say it's unwilling to address? Like how many people came to Jesus with their version of brokenness or need of healing? And he said, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't do that one. Or you're going to have to just, you know, work that out on your own. I mean, he healed every person of every situation. He, he took care of, of, you know, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. So if people are being tormented over their sexuality, God has to have solutions for that because Jesus paid for our peace on the cross. You know, I mean, so, I mean, I just point people like, I can't promise anything, but I, but you should look at, at God because I, when I looked at God, I got the whole kit and caboodle. Okay. But you have, pra you have been teaching this to, for m m many years now to years. many mm -hmm. people and you see the fruit from it. The book, yeah. the journey out, you want the e-copy, I mean, you get it immediately. It's it's so wonderful. Uh, it's uh, uh, go to go to Sid Roth S I D R O T H dot org O R G slash K E N Ken. That's easy. Sid Roth dot org slash Ken. Now, you know, um, I would be remiss because of the presence of God that is on you right now, Ken. And it is so strong. I don't know when I'm going to ask you to pray, but I'm going to ask you in a moment to pray for whatever God tells you because there is, you know, there's different anointings. The only thing I can tell you is there is a sweetness in the spirit emanating out of you right now. 
and uh, I'm going to lead everyone in a prayer. I want to make sure everyone knows the Jesus that rescued you, the Jesus that gave you a wife, the Jesus that gave you children, the Jesus that freed you from those addictions, the Jesus that gave you a purpose for your life, the Jesus that took the depression away from you. I want everyone to know this Jesus, whether you have the situations that Ken has you got situations by being human. Huh, welcome to the race. I know, I'm human too. But I was set free and Ken was set free and I want you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it to the best of your ability. No one's asking you to fake it till you make it. I am saying if you mean it to the best of your ability, God's gonna meet you. Repeat out loud after me, out loud. Dear God, I'm a sinner against you, and you alone have I sinned, and I'm so sorry. I believe the blood of Jesus washes away every sin, and I am clean. I am righteous. It's like today is the first day of the rest of my life. And now that I am clean, Jesus, come and live inside of me. I have made you my Savior. I now make you my Lord. I love you, God. Ken, pray whatever God has you to pray mm -hmm. right now, because there's such a presence that I believe what you pray is going to happen. I believe it. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, what I'm seeing right now is I'm just seeing the different men and women out there, and your heart is so to follow the Lord. Your heart is that you would be able to conduct your sexuality in a godly way, refraining from you know, hooking up with, with the wrong people or, or, you know, doing sexual acts outside of marriage and your, your heart. You know, I just want to affirm in you, God sees your heart. He sees that you don't want to be doing the things that you found yourself doing. And he wants you to know right in the midst, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, for you, you, an individual right there feeling these feelings. The Lord is saying, I want you to look up into my eyes I have love for you. I like you. I want you. I formed you. I've chosen you. You are my creation and I'm not leaving. Come closer to me. Come into me where you will find rest. You will find peace. You will find a sense of assurance and identity like you have never known before. Father, I pray that the sense of your tender fathering would overwhelm and surround these precious people right now. I pray that they would not hear the voice of the enemy, that the voice of the accuser that has tried to, uh, tried to attach their actions or behaviors to their identity or to, to, to label them because they made a mistake or whatever and tried to say, that's who you are. I break the power of that in Jesus' name. We break that lying, evil spirit that would accuse you and bring you down. And I pray, Father, instead they would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, come up here. This is where I am. I want to hug you. I want to let you feel my love, my freedom. And Father, you said in your word that, that Jesus came to set the captives free. And I know so many watching this have felt like a captive. But we say no in Jesus' name. Jesus came to set the captives free. And if that's you, then I, I release in Jesus' name freedom to you. You may go free. You may enter into this beautiful journey of discipleship, of finding out the depths of of who he says that you are, and furthermore, that he empowers you, not by striving, not by a step program, but by relationship with him, will empower you 
to live out. And I just bless you, bless you, bless you. I pray that your cup would be full and would be running over from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, in your emotions, in your spirit, in your body, that you would be full. And I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and I have to tell you, I was blessed. Thank you, Aww. Ken Williams. Yay.